All right, let's get. Oh, cool. Okay. All right, guys, let's get started. I'm really happy to be here. Um, you know, today my talk is about. It's titled "Our Future in Space." It's really um, my talk. Really, is about setting really big goals. Um, for me, that's that's what I do with my life. I have really big goals that I kind of put my whole life towards, and that's what I want to talk about. Um, I'm going to talk about. That better? Yeah. All right. So um, what I was saying is um, the talk is about our future in space. Really, it's about setting big goals. That's, that's kind of what I, I put my life towards, and that's why I want to tell you guys about what I'm doing. Um, also, I'm going to tell you about uh, kind of the big picture that I see and then uh, the actionable steps that I'm taking to get there. Today, um, I actually get to tell you about some, some pretty cool updates from, from what I've been doing for the past uh, two years that actually up until today I haven't been able to talk about. So there's some, some pretty cool fun things you're going to get to hear for the first time. Um, so really uh, I've been transfixed on this one question it, uh, by Gerard O'Neill. He put out in 1969 he asked, is a planetary surface the right place for an expanding s technological civilization? What's going on with this slide? Okay. Um, I was really hooked on that because my whole life I've, I've been an explorer and um, I've always felt like we have a need for exploration. And you know, it's, I think it's intrinsic for humans to explore and honestly I'm a little afraid that we're not doing enough exploration these days. And the way I see it is exploration is, is why we're still not in caves. So after reading uh, or after, after understanding Gerard's uh, quote or his, his question, I started to realize that my dream, the thing that I wanted to make sure happened in my lifetime, was to make sure that we had these, colonies in space. Um, it's a pretty cool idea. It's, the idea has been around since the 70s or even before that in science fiction. And um, it's, it, the idea is to build real cities, not to build tuna cans that people live in and float around in zero gravity, but to build what you see here, cities with gravity and everything like that. And I just thought that would be a really cool future for us to live in, where you could imagine zero gravity sports up in the center where, there's, where the, the whole cylinder's rotating and there's no gravity in the center. I imagined the idea of self-propelled flight and, uh, and you know, just a, a fun place to, to really live. Um, but it's more than that to me. It's not, it's not just the idea of living in a space colony. I think that maybe that's my selfish motive is that I want to make sure we see that day. But really, it's, I, I, honestly, I feel like if we, can, if we can do this, if we can get to the point where we've figured out all the things needed to build colonies in space, then we're going to solve all of humanity's other big challenges. You know, we talk about, you know, we need clean water. We need abundant energy. We need things like that. And it turns out when you go live in space, you have to be 100% self-sufficient. You have to recycle your own waste. You have to create your own water. You have to produce your own energy. By doing that, we can actually bring those technologies back and make life here on Earth better. So, you know, we're going to learn how to be sustainable, how to grow our own food. That's something that can help the developing world. Off-Earth resource mining, when we, when we start getting resources from space, from the moon and from asteroids, then we can stop strip mining uh, mountains and, and areas on Earth. And I think one of the biggest ones is clean energy. We can, you know, by colonizing space, we will be able to harness the solar energy above Earth's atmosphere, transmit to the ground, and once you have energy, you can solve all those other problems. You can, you know, we have enough water on this planet for everybody, we just need better energy sources to uh, do electrolysis and clean it. Um, so going back to that question, you know, I first read this um, question in, uh, when I was in grad school, and it kind of put me on that, that focus of what I would be doing with my life. It turned out that uh, O'Neill actually wrote a book about this. He asked the question to his Princeton physics class in 69. The answer actually came out, no, you don't need uh, to be on a planetary surface. In fact, you could make life a lot better if you weren't, if you were living in colonies in space. Um, and this book kind of became my Bible. It was, it was the instruction manual of how to do this because when he wrote it in the 70s, he wrote it um, explaining how to do it with the technology of the time. So he showed how the upcoming space shuttle that hadn't even uh, come online yet could be used to start building these colonies. You could use the external tanks and, and make a livable, livable space. 
So I really got hooked on that that, that, that there actually was actionable steps that we could take. And in fact, they talked about it in the 70s of how you could do it. So I, I began to ask myself this, what, what's the problem with this? Why haven't we built colonies in space yet? If he said that we could do it in, in the 70s and showed how it was possible, why haven't we done it? And uh, so I researched this a lot, and I found out that if you look at every problem the space industry has, there, it all gets boiled down to actually one bottleneck, and that bottleneck is Earth's gravity well. So, you know, the Earth has such a strong uh, gravity well, everything has to leave the surface of this planet. You have to escape that gravity well, that, that, uh, that force to get into space. And that, th you know, that's what the problem is. You know, the Apollo astronauts had to travel 10 times the speed of a rifle bullet just to get on their path to the moon. 10 times the speed of a rifle bullet. Anything we've ever sent outside of Earth's gravity field has had to travel that fast. Um, you know, the, the Saturn V rocket, um, only 2% of it was actually constitutes the mass of the thing that actually went to the moon. So you have that gigantic rocket and only 2% of it is actually the stuff you need to get somewhere. Uh, so it's no wonder that everything we've ever put into space is so complex. You get one chance to do this, it costs you know, billions of dollars, people spend a decade just building this thing, and it has to work. You, you have no room for failure. And um, I really think that's the problem. You know, we, NASA's famous for that saying, failure is not an option. And I feel like that actually is the problem. Failure should be an option. And, you know, we're, in the world I'm in, in, in the startup world, you, you fail early, you fail often. And I think that's, that's kind of the route I've been trying to push towards the, the space industry, and so, so far it's working. Um, and, and just to drive that, that point home, this is a, uh, a graph that NASA put out. It, uh, it's kind of hard to see all the words, but basically what it's showing is down at the bottom line is the, um, the, the mass of the space station in low Earth orbit. If you wanted to do a Mars mission today with current technology, it would take 12 times the mass of the space station in low Earth orbit to get you to Mars. So this, uh, this graph basically shows all these different technology areas that need to get solved to drive down the mass of a Mars mission just to get within the realm of what we already have in, in space. So it's a big problem. So I like this analogy. This is, um, this is a ship in the middle of a city. It doesn't make any sense. There's no, no reason that you would ever build a ship in the middle of a city. You build a ship along the shores which you would sail. Um, ironically, this is exactly how we do space today. Everything we've ever put into space has had to start on, on uh, terra firma, uh, unlike uh, how ships are built. So it's no wonder that we haven't built these space colonies yet. If everything has to come from the surface of the planet, it's no wonder we haven't built things the size of cities in space. So how do we do it? Um, O'Neill talked about it in the, in the 60s and 70s. Science fiction talked about it before then. The idea is, is building these things in space. The, I think that's the obvious conclusion, is that you're going to build these colonies in space. Um, the idea always had been you have construction worker astronauts doing this and it takes a, a huge amount of manpower to build these colonies. So the approach that, that me and my colleagues started focusing on was a new way of doing it, using uh, new technologies, technologies that actually are only just now coming online. So the idea is, is 3D printing. If you can take a, basically a robot that can manufacture, that's what a 3D printer is, you can start building these, these colonies. So just to give you a, the overview of 3D printing, you can build things like tools. You can build parts that carry fluids and electrical lines. You can build out of aerospace grade metals, titanium, aluminum, stainless steel. You can build thing, complex structures like rocket nozzles or turbine blades that have internal cooling channels built right in. You can build gigantic structures. This is an example of a 3D printer that builds houses. Um, and the, and these, uh, these scientists are actually showing that you can do it with, with uh, lunar regolith and things found on other planets. And what I'm most excited about is building things that couldn't be built any other way. Structures that only added to manufacturing where you build layer upon layer can build. And it really gets around that fundamental problem. No more would we have to design everything to fit within the little uh, launch fairing at the top of a rocket. You're not constrained to that launch fairing diameter. You don't have to survive the tremendous loads of launch. You know, everything we've ever built for space, we actually built for launch. You have to survive 
you know, ex extreme um, G loads and vibration loads. So we're building for launch, and that's the problem. It's an eight minute ride, and then after that, you're in zero gravity, your structures could be uh, toothpick thin. So in the, you know, in the long term, it's, it's about uh, mining, mining resources in space. And the way we see it, there's a paradigm shift happening where every, one day everything in space will be made in space. And that was the idea that started the company Made in Space. Um, we saw that big vision and we figured out the actionable steps to get there. We laid out this original objective back in 2010 when we started. The first was perform experiments in microgravity to learn about 3D printing adapt 3D printers to work in microgravity, and then fly 3D printers on the International Space Station. That's what should have been after that if it was in PowerPoint. So manufacturing in space is needed now. A recent study by NASA showed that 82% of all the failed parts on the ISS could have been manufactured on the ISS. One example is the tool bag that escaped when an astronaut let it unhook from her belt. So, you know, one of the examples that we show at Made in Space is, is this one. If you all remember when that fateful day when Tom Hanks had to save his crew and they said, Houston, we have a problem. Well, we found a solution specifically to the air filter. We, uh, if you remember, it was a square filter that had to fit into a round hole. We designed that filter in under an hour, printed it, and had it functional by the end of the day. Just an example of, of how 3D printing could be used today to reduce earth uh, dependency. So back to those goals, we've, um, back in 2011, we were awarded a contract by NASA where we flew zero gravity flights. So we did that first thing. We tested our 3D printers. That's me floating in zero gravity. We learned a lot about how 3D printing works in microgravity and also how to adapt it. So the picture that you see here is one is before it was adapted. The second picture is after. We learned how to make these things work. So obviously the next step, now that we know how to make them work, is the International Space Station. And this is where uh, the news kind of gets exciting today. Um, so going back to that benefits uh, for the ISS, about 30% of that is plastic parts. And that's what we're focusing on, is how to build plastic parts on space station. That things like tools, spare parts, devices that can uh, hold biological samples for all the science that's going on. Uh, so we have some current progress. If any of you heard the State of the Union address a couple weeks ago, President Obama talked about the need for 3D printing. He said that uh, you know, 3D printing has a potential to revolutionize the way we make everything. Just last Friday, Charlie Bolden, the director of NASA, um, came out and talked about 3D printing as well. It, came, it was in this popular mechanics article. He talked about how um, you know, one day all you need to send to space is your 3D printer and you make everything when you get there. And that's exactly the idea that we've been telling NASA for about two years. So it's really good to hear them echoing our thoughts. And um, to drive that point home, this is some pretty exciting news. We're just now announcing this. We are under contract with NASA to put a 3D printer on the space station. Um, the first one will be flying in 2014. So actually, it will be delivered to NASA about a year from right now. Um, so this picture, this is us at NASA. There's a glove box behind us, and that's where they do science. So the, the, the first printer is going to be inside this glove box on the space station. We're doing a lot of science, learning about how 3D printing actually works. Um, in the end, we're going to fly another printer um, in, in its own facility. It's called, uh, it's through NanoRacks, what you see the astronaut working there. Our printer will be inside of one of these boxes, and it'll be a service-based printer. When astronauts need something built, they'll use our service to print things. We can even print things in space and bring them back to the ground. So we've had uh, customers come to us and say they found solutions to their problems on Earth that could only be manufactured in zero gravity. So that's one of the ideas is that we actually, it's not just for reducing, reducing dependency in space, it's also for making things better on the ground. Um, so that's, that's the, the first step. And obviously we're working towards the day that, that we have a Star Trek replicator. So I, I think the way I want to close is just uh, this analogy. You know, one day computers, um, they took up entire rooms. They weren't used for much more than government, um, government uses and being in research settings. So it would have been really hard for people at that time to imagine that one day your computer would be inside your pocket and would be far, far more powerful than what that is today. So I think really that's where the space industry is today. We're on that, that cusp where we're moving away from it having to be a government-run thing 
where it, we start to look at all the feasible um, uh, opportunities with space. And that's my mission. That's my goal. I hope um, some of you join me, because I think that future is going to be amazing. And then uh, we're hiring if you guys are also interested in that. All right. Questions?